Welcome back to the second class of Interactive Machine Learning. Today, I am super excited to invite Corey Mathewson here to talk with us, but not yet. Um, I just had a few points uh, I wanted to share. Uh, as, you, uh, as I said before, as is on the syllabus, as is on the website, and as you can see flashing at the top of Zoom, we are recording this. Uh, so again, if you want to keep your videos off for use synonyms or whatever, uh, please feel free to do so. If you're uncomfortable in any way, please let me know. One thing I would like to bring up is we are in a very different learning environment. You all notice this, but there are people who think about this. So it's probably in your interest if you are taking multiple classes online now to think a little bit about how, what success looks like and how that's different from a normal class. So here are a couple of very short articles. The first one was talking about metacognition and mindfulness. So to, to my mind, one of the big differences between a graduate class and an undergraduate class, undergraduate class, you uh, teach them something, you walk them through it, you show them it, you evaluate them, you grade them, you correct them, and then you go on. In a graduate class, it's much more, I'm going to help you learn the material and if you don't understand something, you need to be self-aware enough to ask for help. Whether that is help from Matt, help from the TAs, help from a friend, help from looking up more information, but it, there's much more responsibility on the student. And now that we're online, it's even more so. Because when we're in person and I see a student that is falling asleep because they don't understand what's going on or just looks really confused, it's much easier for me to say, Hey, Corey, are you actually getting this? Come on, let's, let's talk a little bit here. But since we're all online, I really, it's really hard to do that. So it's, up, it's really up to you guys more than, more than it is in past semesters to try to be on top of that. And if, you, if you'd ever like to talk about that, I'd be very interested in, in trying to troubleshoot or come up with ideas for how, how to best do that. The other point, uh, and this was for Coursera. So on Coursera, you may pay for a class or maybe it's free. Most people who start a class in Coursera do not complete it. I, I've never completed a Coursera class, but I've started a bunch. Um, and part of that is because I never went into the discussion forums. So maybe that was my mistake. But not only is using the discussion forums good because that's part of your course grade, but also it will help you become more engaged and I believe it will help you learn the material better. So these are just a few suggestions. I'm sure there's a lot of other suggestions online out there. So I do encourage you to spend a little bit of time thinking about this, how you, how you can succeed, not just in this class, but the other classes that you're going to have to take online. <coughs> Last time I mentioned the, the Mechanical Turk, I thought I would show you a picture of it. I, I had uh, said it was the 1700s. It was actually started in the late 1700s. You can see on the left what the audience saw, and on the right is the inside where you had the little guy who was moving the levers around. So that was the, I think, the first example of a computer that was, or a robot that was actually a human. So kind of a cool piece of AI history trivia. There are a couple of very short assignments on E-Class. I mentioned them last time, but I just wanted to reiterate they're due by Saturday night. If you have any trouble, just let um, me or the TAs know either by the compute uh, 656 email or on Discord. There are a couple of papers that I would like you to read on Tuesday. So now I am trying to switch over to the course website. Um, Good. So yell at me if you cannot see the course website, in particular, the course schedule. So I'm trying to, I realize I should probably split this out in, into Tuesday and Thursday. So today is Thursday. There is, um, Corey is lecturing. I asked you to read this three page paper, but it was super last minute. So I'm not going to grade anyone on that. And there's some work due before the next class. Then for Tuesday, there is not currently a guest speaker but there are two articles I would like you to read. So hopefully this, this kind of setup makes sense where I've got the, the dates, the general topic, if there's a guest speaker and the stuff that's due. Again, if you ever have any questions, Discord or email, 
or if you have suggestions for how I could make this calendar clearer, that would be wel very welcome as well. Uh, oh, and the thing I wanted to point out in particular, the two papers I'm asking you to read are both at CHI um, and Computer Human Interaction, I believe, and they're 20 years apart. So start with the, the classic one from 1999 and then go to the one from last year. And I'd like, I, I'm planning on Tuesday to have a discussion about that. In Discord, there is now a Corey, Corey Matheson Quanda channel which was supposed to be Q and A, but it turned into Quanda. So as we are going through um, the guest lecture today, we'll be looking at the Discord. I think Corey will be able to see it, but also Nick and I will try to call out particular things. If you would like to talk, jump in, turn off your microphone, interrupt, or you can also say Q, question, hand, um, and then when Corey has a chance, when Corey takes a breath, I can interrupt and say, hey, Shrew, time for you to ask a question. Or if Corey sees a question, he, could, he can uh, call on them. Because ty typing questions is totally fine. I personally like hearing the questions more because you, there's more nuance when someone's actually talking, especially if you can see them. But you know, as, as you have probably seen when you send someone a nice email message and they completely misinterpret it, it is easier to misinterpret text than other forms of communication. The last thing I'll point out is during the last class, I basically did, oh yeah, yeah, good point. Good point, Koi, in, in the Discord, thanks for that. And then everyone who's watching the video afterwards has no idea what just happened. So I'm gonna try to be better about saying, oh, Corey, yes, you asked a question about why is the sky blue? Well, in this case, it has to do with, so if, if you notice me forgetting that, feel free to call me out. Um, hopefully that will make the videos for this class more more enjoyable or at least um, more understandable. Just a guy. <laughs> Corey is just a guy. He is also a research scientist with DeepMind and a lab scientist with the Creative Destruction Lab. He does have a PhD from U of A. He is also interested in Human in the Loop RL, which is why I know him pretty well, as well as computational creativity. He also does improv. Um, improv theater with Rapid Fire here in Edmonton. And he's doing some cool stuff at the intersection of AI and um, improv. So now, without further ado, I'll stop interrupting and turn it back over to Corey. I love it. Thank you so much. That is the best introduction I've had all day, hands down. Um, it's so great to be here. I'm so excited. Why I'm excited is because this is exactly the kind of class that I would have loved to have gotten to take when I was doing my schooling at the U of A. So I'm so excited that Matt is teaching this class and so honored that I get to be a part of the delivery of it. So what I want you to take away from this lecture today, uh, Compute 656, is that all machine learning is interactive machine learning. This is my like big push, my thesis, uh, my grand statement that all machine learning is interactive machine learning, and if we don't think about it like that, we're doing a disservice to the other humans in our world. Um, okay, so first off, well, we're talking about humans in the loop, so it's good to get a mental picture of what I think of when I think of humans in the loop, and, and here's a bit of the plan for today. First, I'm going to give some introduction about me so you kind of have a sense of where I'm coming from. I'm gonna give you some main takeaways, specifically that all machine learning is interactive machine learning. If there's one thing you take away from today, it's that. Then I wanna do a bit of an exercise. So there's gonna be a bit of an interactive component. So if you're in Discord, give me a wave, say hi. We're gonna be using the Discord channel to be writing things down. And we're also gonna be breaking up into smaller breakout rooms. So yeah, I see some hands coming in right now. This is great. I love seeing the waves. It keeps this a little bit more interactive and a little bit more engaging for everybody. Um, we're talking about human-centered interactive machine learning. So if you did read the three-page paper that Matt sent over, maybe uh, you know send the number seven in the chat, and let's just see if there's some sevens that pop up. Oh, yeah. Oh, now we're talking. 
I love this waterfall. Okay, so if you've read the paper, then we'll be in a good place to discuss some of these things. Uh, specifically, we're talking about human-centered design and the whiteboard model, as I talk about it, uh, which is a design thinking exercise. Then we're going to talk about developing these systems and the pre-mortem exercise. And then we're going to talk about deploying and disseminating machine learning systems for other humans. Uh, and then I'll give you some summary, some further reading, and some discussion. Oh, I love seeing just a wall of sevens. That's great. Uh, so this is me in a nutshell. I did three degrees at the University of Alberta. I did a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering, where I was looking, if you could see in this tiny image, this very small image. Can I get a little pointer? Yeah. Uh, this is um, cancer cells, and this is photoacoustic microscopy. Um, so that means you're shining a laser into tissue and then listening to the heat reverberate from the heated up tissue. And it's not heating up to a dangerous amount, but it's, it's heating up. So it's understanding the human body. My master's was understanding the human body in that we're measuring blood flow. This is a cross section of a body, like chopped right at the belt line. Um, and then my PhD was in computer science. Why did I move from biomedical engineering to computer science? Because people kept telling me that we would leave the hard problems for the computer scientists. And I thought, I want to be solving some of the hard problems. Uh, Scott Tassin says, what kind of cancer is this? And well, Scott, you've, you've identified, um, you, you've called me out here. This is actually a phantom cancer, uh, which is a simulated cancer, almost a synthetic design that allows us to tune our uh, methods, you know. So it's it's not exactly, but it's simulating a carcinoma, um, which is like, can exist under skin cells. So it's not very deep under the skin. Um, throughout my education, and please do keep asking uh, questions, it's great. Um, Throughout my education, I've also been doing improv, improv theater. Um, yeah, I, I usually ask if anyone has seen improv before. And this is kind of a funny thing because I can't see the grid of a bunch of faces like laughing and waving. So I will keep asking to go to the Discord. But if you've seen improv, you kind of know what it is. If you haven't seen it, it's easy to explain. It's just making things up on stage. So you're doing a theater performance without any script or planning. And what I did for my PhD was put some chatbot language models on stage to do improvised theater. And then we modified them in different ways. Uh, I, I see someone has even been to one of these improv shows. That's fantastic. Um, we've done them as part of the reinforcement learning and deep learning summer schools. And you know, it was al allowing me to collide my machine learning ideas with my theater ideas. And both of those fields kind of complemented each other. So there's a chance maybe later in the semester that I'll get to come back and show you what some of those techniques and sort of tools look like. But uh, you know, for now, uh, we'll just foreshadow it in, in, in true theatrical narrative style and say like, this thing exists and it's wonderful. And then last year, I graduated, I got my PhD and moved from Edmonton to Montreal, where I joined DeepMind Montreal to work with Doina Precup, who's a reinforcement learning researcher and the fantastic DeepMind team here. So that's me in a nutshell. I would love to learn about all of you because if you are the select few who have selected to come into an interactive machine learning class, it means that we probably believe some of the same things and so we should share a conversation. So please do reach out and, and let's keep the conversation going. First off, all machine learning is interactive. All machine learning is interactive. Interaction is the design, development, deployment, and dissemination of research, of the systems that you engineer and build. And that interaction is absolutely critical because it connects your ideas with other people. And we, we should feel a responsibility to consider the other humans in the equation. And if we don't, then we can run into problems of fairness and accountability and transparency and safety. And there are serious problems that emerge if we don't think about the humans that are interacting with the machine learning systems that we're building. And I understand from some of the surveys in the first 
class that most of the people here have at least thought about building or have built and deployed machine learning systems. Uh, I'm seeing a nod from Matt, I think. So like most people have done something, which means that people are using the things you're building, which means that you should be thinking about the safety of those people in the, in the interactions that they you know, are, are, are taking upon themselves. So this is the classic high level view of an AI or machine learning system. This is how I look at it. Um, on the left in blue is raw data. Most of these systems are fueled by data. That data is then processed in some way, usually through some heuristics or rules. Then there's this like fuzzy, you know, black box that is, I, I guess I should have made it a black box literally, but it's like AI and ML and magic and, you know, secret ingredients. And then the witches kind of stir the pot, the cauldron, and then out pop predictions. Those predictions might get fed back into the system uh, to learn with some kind of update rule. And there's also some kind of input or feedback that happens online during the deployment of a system. So in my head, all of these machine learning systems that we're thinking about, when you're thinking about your pilot studies or other models that you're building, this is a, a pretty good high level view. So I would argue that every single step in this loop, this is often called the learning loop, has to do with humans or you know, interacts, touches humans in some way. <laughs> I, I love XKCD. It feels like there's always a cartoon that is perfectly applicable in the moment. Um, so raw data often comes from humans or is based on sensed data, sensor data, like the cancer data I showed from my you know, BME undergrad. So it's about humans. That data was about humans and collected by humans. Then the process data was cleaned by humans and filtered by humans. The AI machine learning system is most often designed by humans, or at least it's a, a system that has been designed by a system that has been designed by humans in some of the more recent you know, machine learning auto ML methods. And if you want to get into auto ML, that's a fun place to talk to. Then the predictions are most often given to humans or they impact humans in some way. So those predictions might be like the angle to steer a self-driving car, which isn't exactly given to a human, but it's given to the car that the human is in. And then the input and feedback comes from humans, and that can happen online with some of the more online you know, human feedback algorithms that I think you'll learn about from Brad Knox and some of the work that Matt Taylor has done. Um, or it can come from other people that aren't directly interacting with the algorithm. So you know, at its highest level, this machine learning loop is designed by humans to solve a problem that's framed by humans. The cost function of the machine learning model is also defined by humans. So like just because it's cross entropy doesn't mean it's like not human interactive or just because it's some other objective loss function doesn't mean it's not human based. And the predictions in the interface is all you know, human based as well. So, it's all user experience, it's all user design, and we should be thinking about that as we design and build these systems. So here's the first exercise of the day. It's called Today's Interactions. So in the Discord, I want you to take some time today, really think, stepping back from this moment right now, I think it's like 1119 in Edmonton, or I don't know, wherever you are in the world, maybe you know, share where you are in the world, um, if you feel comfortable doing so. Think about what interactive machine learning systems you've interacted with today already. Okay, so take a moment, think back, and try to write down all of the different ML systems that you've interacted with. I see some people saying where they're at, which is super cool to see all the different locations, and I would love it if you posted in the Discord some of the systems you interacted with. Okay, so I'm seeing Google search, I'm seeing Google speech recognition, I'm seeing latitudes and longitudes, uh, autocomplete, I'm seeing uh, automatic background green screen, iMessage autocomplete. Okay, lots of language-based ones with Siri. Okay, keep going, keep going. This is great. Google, universal sentence encoder, BERT, Zoom, QBs, if that's how that's pronounced, uh, that you know, that, that you're using a lot here. It's interesting that you said Zoom just in general. Any more specific ideas on what machine learning is used in the Zoom world? 
Hello, Iron Man from Nepal. I see Snapchat Bitmoji suggestions. That's fantastic. Google Photos, image detection, handwritten notes to text. So this is wonderful. So this is like, uh, yeah, I guess I made a very false assumption about what time it might be for people. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's on me. And I'm seeing a lot of different systems. So now I want you to take a look at the ones that you wrote down, the systems that you wrote down, and answer these questions. Who had the initiative in the interaction? That is to say, who started the interaction, who ended the interaction, and who decided you know, whose turn it was in the interaction? And maybe write down a, a thought or two on that. How did it go? Was it good or bad? Was it as you expected or not? And how could it have gone better? So, okay. Um, I see a great question from Graham that I will absolutely get to after this uh, exercise. This is this is fantastic. And um, Graham, if you're comfortable, I might go to you to to actually ask the question. Um, but let's first do the let's go through this exercise. Thank you. Um, so, who had initiative? How did it go? How could it have gone better? Several people are typing. This is wonderful. Uh, the other nice thing Graham has done is asked me a question just before I had some time to think about the answer. So now we can actually get into it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, a lot less people ready to reflect on how the interaction went, or they're taking a little more time with it, uh, which I appreciate. QB said, I made all the decisions to start and end, it was both good and bad. Matt, in all my interactions, the human started the interaction and ended it. Credit card limit approval. Rohan, that can be stressful, and uh, I hope it was positive. The bank had initiative. It went fine, and it... <laughs> How could the interaction have gone better? Most likely, yeah. Um, so let's... Let's take uh, one here. Scott says, for Google search, I had the initiative. The interaction went well. It was the best suggestion. I guess it could have suggested it even earlier if Google knows everything about me. That's good. Ravan, if I'm pronouncing that right, said, I had initiative with voice to text. It went well. They got everything I said right. I don't think it could have gone better. Yeah, that's interesting. So it, you're already thinking about the metrics on which you are assessing the performance of the system. Um, here's here's uh, one extension that I'm seeing. Graham says, I'm not sure who started it with a, hey, Google, I asked it to do something, but it was listening constantly for when I did ask. So there were who started it, who you know jumped in when. Uh, this is the last one I'll take. Iron Man says, for the Bitmoji suggestion, the initiation was the human. You did the typing. So they, it might have been listening the whole time, but you actually started this interaction. Uh, suggested the Bitmoji. Okay, Snapchat suggested it. And the final decision, I made the final decision. Okay, so there was almost a dialogue between you and this system on how the interaction was going to go. It was smooth in your opinion. <laughs> Shrew is seeing a pattern here, which is that everything may have been initiated by a human. Um, that's a very interesting observation. Shru, would you feel comfortable jumping on and, and talking about that observation? Hey, sure. So I have a sense that everything was initiated by a human because it's you that needs something, right? So you kind of initiate the process, for example, let's take the AI system where uh, the, for example, the autocomplete suggestion, mm -hmm. you need, uh, so it's basic. It basically started off because you are the one who is typing out something, and then the autocomplete happens, and uh, you are initiating it. Even in that situation, I'm guessing everything was initiated by a human in almost every case. The AI doesn't really jump in on its own to help us out, uh, mm -hmm. unless and until we actually do something to trigger it, basically. I, I appreciate you jumping in. Thank you so much uh, to, to share your thoughts with the class. I, I do agree with you that most of these interactions with interactive machine learning systems are human 
driven, human led and human initiated. I would be curious if anyone could come up with a counter example of a system that they interacted with today as a response to a system that had started the, um, the interaction. So like off the top of my head, I'm thinking about an alarm clock. Does it count if an alarm clock goes off and then I have to push the button? Um, or Rohan says YouTube recommendation. So this means that the predictive system was offering a recommendation and then it was up to the human to respond to it. Okay. Yeah, so it's the notification. Uh, yeah. So what about the, notifications that pop up on your phone screen? Yeah, okay, so now we're talking. This is great. I think this has really opened up a lot for uh, some people. So I, I really appreciate you uh, bringing this up, Shrew, because it seems like notifications and recommendations uh, or advertising, as Rohan says, really turn that initiative on its head. That is to say that those are imposing of the system on our own natural um, interaction. So. I do think that there is a back and forth with systems and we are starting to trust systems to take a bit more of the initiative. So one of the things that we can think about as we build our pilot studies and models is how can we build a system that humans will trust or that is non-intrusive enough that we can allow it to initiate some of the interaction as opposed to just being responsive like some of the Hey Google interactions. Um, okay, I, I appreciate all of the discussion. This is absolutely fantastic. I, I want to keep going a little bit because Graham had a good question that I want to go back to before we move on to the next section. Graham, do you feel comfortable jumping on and asking the question? Because I thought it was great and I'd love to hear you um, kind of phrase it and rephrase it. For sure. So you've made the, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you've made the, the comment that most of this stuff is all centered on humans. And I was just wondering, uh, when I think of most things, they're, they're usually centered on humans. So the examples I gave were like welding or cooking, anything like that, that's still an activity done by humans for humans. We're in every step of the loop, much like we're in every step of the loop here. So I was wondering where the distinction becomes where like this is a bigger deal in this case than it is in welding or cooking or any other activity. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. I, I appreciate the question. And uh, it, in my opinion, I think it's important to state that all machine learning is interactive machine learning, because that point is not obvious to most people. I think it was obvious to you that most things are human made and for humans and by humans. But some people have a notion of AI or machine learning that it is autonomous and it is too remove humans from the equation. That, it, that is that some of the things we are building as AI researchers and scientists and engineers and technologists and program managers and all these sorts of roles that people play in machine learning is to remove humans from this loop. That is, can we generate data? Can we automatically generate AI? You know, can the, the feedback be automated? How can we get humans out of the equation? And I'm trying to push the argument that, in fact, humans are inherent to the equation, just like they are in building a house, just like they are in cooking, and that removing the notion of removing humans from it is almost, you know, counterintuitive to what we know about engineering and building uh, as a society. So I, I wonder how that kind of, yeah. So I, I guess I don't mean to draw a distinction between AI and other things, but rather draw a similarity and say, building AI systems is a lot more like engineering. And we should be focused on these questions of who the humans are, how they will interact with the system, and what we should expect from them um, in the same way that we should do that when we're thinking about building a restaurant or, you know, welding, a, you know, a joint for a door hinge or something. Um, yeah. Thoughts? Okay. Yeah, I, I com completely agree with that. Cool. Cool. I, I, I appreciate you jumping in. Thank you. And it was a nice, a nice setup for continuing uh, to, to say rather than draw the distinction between these things, rather AI is about how humans will interact with these systems and how they can interact with them in new, interesting, creative ways. Um, so Vlad says uh, a question. This is the last question we'll take before we move on to the next section. 
Vlad says, in general, do you think we should try to remove as much human interaction? Or I guess are you saying that no matter what, it will always be interactive in the sense that if you remove the human from the algorithm design, you still have a human designing the algorithm that designs algorithms. So it's impossible. So Vlad, this is almost a philosophical question. And so I like that. And I think it's one that we can dig into a little bit more. If there's some time at the end of this, we can dig into that. But I do, I, I rather want to push the pragmatic statement that we are currently building systems. You and I and Matt and all these people that we interact with are building machine learning systems. And it's up to us, it's our responsibility to think about the humans just as much as we think about the data set, the algorithm, the you know user interface, that sort of thing. So I don't think that we should be trying to remove as much human interaction as possible, but rather we should be building systems that aid, augment, and inspire humans as much as possible. And I'll also point out that these are awesome questions so that even if we cannot address them all during this lecture, we can always talk about them in the future. So please keep, keep the thoughts coming, even if we don't get, get to it today. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we've gotten to the crux, I think. Responsible ML requires human understanding and empathy throughout that whole learning loop. And ignorance has its implications. So understanding and empathy takes time and energy. And ignorance leads to unintended consequences. So I'm sure that all of you can like close your eyes and think about issues that have stemmed from AI designers deploying systems in the real world without the proper precautions necessary. I'm sure that you know, some people here even have ideas on the tip of their tongue. Yeah, QB says Tay as a first example. The two of my first examples that I came to is these self-driving cars that started jumping onto the road before it was ready. So the tragic, you know, accidents or collisions that happen between self-driving vehicles. And Tay, of course, which was a Twitter bot that turned pretty malicious pretty fast and it didn't have sort of safeguards in place uh, soon enough. So let's talk about human-centered interactive machine learning. As you are all in this class, you're going to be designing your pilot projects. You're going to be designing an interactive machine learning pilot study. So you should be thinking about the design, the development, and the deployment of these systems. Uh, and to do that, you have to think about the humans that are going to be interacting with them. So we'll go through this in three phases, the design, the development, and the deployment. And I saw a bunch of sevens before. So I imagine that a lot of this will be, you know, familiar to you. Uh, so please do continue to reflect in the Discord on, you know, what stood out or, or what questions are interesting. So first, you all have uh, a pilot project in mind. Or maybe you don't have a project in mind yet, but you're sort of coming to that in this class. As you are building a machine learning hypothesis, you want to be posing it as a testable question. Because these are optimization systems, we want to be posing our questions as something that we can optimize towards. So what evidence can we use to support it? How can we dispute our hypothesis with evidence? And what evidence would change our mind? So this is like good science practice. Uh, and, and given your, you know, this is a grad class in computing science, these should all be familiar to you. Uh, so the focus here is on the hypothesis, what we're actually trying to do with our models, as opposed to the method itself. It does feel like in computing science, there is a lot of focus put on innovations in the method space, but that is all to the end of interactive machine learning. That is to say the hypothesis that some of these improved models will improve the lives and experiences of other humans. So keep that as the focus. So the next thing you want to do with your pilot study is start to define your values and principles. So what's important to you as you design your machine learning system? Why is it important is a good question to ask. Why might it be important to other people? Or why might it not be important to other people? And who are the people that are going to be impacted by it? How is it going to make humanity better? Now, I'm not saying that everything that we build has to like be a positive delta on you know, general utility of the entire planet, but rather incremental progress for one or two people does make humanity better. And who benefits if your model works? That is to say, if you build the next generation face classification emotion detector, who's gonna benefit from that? And who might be at risk if that happens? Who might be... Um, you know, challenged by it, who might be, 
uh, this is great. So Delaney has brought up uh, this, this work from Timnit Gebru, a colleague at Google. And this is a fantastic uh, talk to see. And Timnit is a fantastic researcher in this entire space of fair, equitable, and you know, human under, un, uh, understanding and centered machine learning. So I, I heartily recommend it. Because a lot of the focus there is who's impacted by the model. And oftentimes, it is the people that are already at risk, underrepresented, um, or in protected classes, or are already, you know, um, unfairly treated by, historically by society, and even now by society. So as you are looping in the humans, so think about those IML systems that you use today, all the ones that we discussed in the Discord channel. What data of yours did they use? What information of yours did they use? How did they perceive you? And how might that perception have been differently if you were a different person? How, how did they get your consent to use that data or information? Was it explicit? Did you sign a contract that they could use your information? What was the consent conversation like? Who could use these systems for harm? That is to say, uh, Timnit talks about this too, that like there are definitely organizations in the world that want to use scientific and technological advancements, uh, not for the betterment of all humanity. Um, who could do that? And what, how does that make you feel about the systems that you're building? And know that the choices that you make, just like the choices that a welder makes on how they weld a bridge, will impact real human lives. And this is something that is stressed in engineering, but isn't stressed as much historically in computing science. And now we want to talk about the goal. OK, so we're getting towards building machine learning systems. And I know a lot of you think of machine learning, and it's like, OK, well, it'll be reinforcement learning, it'll be supervised learning. But like, first, we should start with the humans, start with the stakeholders, then get to the goal. What's our measurable metric of interest? And this metric should be related to human betterment. That is to say, how does it make humans experience better. The metric of interest is not always the same optimization loss for your model. That is to say that your model might optimize for something like cross entropy loss or average regret or any of these machine learning cost functions. That may not exactly be the metric of interest that you're trying to improve. So a bank might be doing the credit limit approval prediction, um, you know, and what is the model that they have trying to optimize, but what is their metric of interest? Their metric of interest is probably related to the customer at the bank, and the model's optimization is related to the reducing the risk for the bank. I, I, I'm waving my hands because I don't actually know the model in, in question. So how do you test the safety of your model? This is a big question in ML right now. And what are the tough problems towards your goal? That is to say, what are the hard parts about your problem? And are they more human-based? Or are they more data-based? Or are they human data-based? Or is it processing? Is it evaluation? Is it inference? Once you start thinking about the data, and remember that all data is from humans and about humans, <laughs> David Tao caught it. Thank you. Uh, think about what your ideal data set is. So you're probably thinking about your pilot study and you're thinking about, okay, how am I going to train a machine learning system to do this thing? I'll probably need a bunch of data. I know that machine learning systems need a bunch of data. So what is the ideal data set? What does it look like? How much does it cost to get that data? What rights are there to the data? What biases would there be in the data? Like uh, Google image classification had a bunch of biases built into the data that they were using. And that's true about most of the data sets that we use. I myself trained some language models to do online you know, improv. And we trained it on every movie script that's ever existed. Now, the problem with every movie script is that most movies are racist and sexist. And this is inherent because it's a you know part of our society and the historical baggage that we carry with us. So we had to do a lot of work as system designers to make sure that the system that we deployed didn't exactly reflect 
that data distribution, but rather a safer data distribution that allowed us to deploy it in public. So what processing and filtering will you do? How are you gonna safely store that data? And you know, before everything split it into training, test and validation and separate your data, data streams, I can't say that enough. I'm sure you hear that a lot from machine learning people. Do it, do it sooner rather than later. Um, so now it's time for the second design uh, breakout exercise. So uh, this one we're going to break out into small groups and you can stop listening to me talk for a few minutes. Um, we're gonna get into groups and discuss uh, interactive machine learning research ideas. So these can be either your pilot study proposal ideas, if you have one. Um, if you don't have one or you don't know exactly what it's gonna be yet, you can try to come up with one or discuss it in your team. If you can't come up with one, I've listed three here. So think about health monitoring, like uh, you know heart rate monitoring, um, and, and predicting heart events, a toxicity classifier for Twitter, which is something I work a lot with, like understanding negative, hateful speech on Twitter, or a chatbot, so like a system that you text and maybe it's a, a chatbot built for therapy, so you can share your feelings and it'll predict if you're you know, having a good day or a bad day. And I want you to discuss a hypothesis, human-centric hy hypothesis, what's the goal of building one of these systems and what's the data required to build it? And who are the stakeholders that are impacted by the system? Who would be interested in the system? Uh, and how do you start to solve your problem? Okay, so I, I, we're gonna break off into groups. Um, this is great. Uh, Scott, I see some questions. Let's get back to these after the whiteboard model exercise. Um, for now, let's break out into groups and I want you to discuss this um, these points. So let's take five minutes. Matt, can we send people into groups? Awesome. So we had a great time in our room. I would love to hear about some of the models. Um, it, if you have one and you want to speak for your group, feel free to jump in on the uh, audio. Or if you want to type it out, feel free to add it to the Discord. Um, Is there anyone who wants to share one of their ideas for what their model might look like? Or is this uh, the moment? Sure, yeah. I'll, I'll talk, why not? Um, Thank you. So uh, one project idea that I've been thinking about with some people in my lab is that um, we do assistive robotics. And so there are people with disabilities or whatever who can't as easily move. Um, and so on a robot arm, you have like, and the one that we use has like seven degrees of freedom. So if you don't know what that means, like just imagine moving your arm. So like that's one degree, rotating two degrees, and then every finger motion is like a number of degrees. But for these people, it's not as easy to control the robot and have access to all the degrees of freedom. And so it's easier to have a smaller action space. So like a joystick that you can move up, back, left and right. So that's mm -hmm. two degrees of freedom. And so our hypothesis is that there's this flavor of generative modeling called normalizing flows where you can kind of map a smaller dimensional space to a higher dimensional space. And there's been previous work using VAEs to do this. And so our hypothesis is basically we can use normalizing flows to accomplish the same idea. Um, and hopefully, ideally in a user study, we would have it be something that feels natural to how someone would actually want to use it, I guess. Um, yeah, I don't know if I need to keep talking, but that's the gist of it. Uh, that's great. Can you maybe speak very briefly about the stakeholders who would be impacted or interested in your system? Uh, so company, like if we had to make it concrete, uh, I think Canova is the company um, for the flavor of assistive robotic arms that we have. And they might be interested in this because it would make it easier for patients or users of this product to control robots and like be more free in their life um, and not require like, a nurse or something to help them as much, but I can't comment too much on that. That's great, that's perfect. Thank you so much for weighing in, uh, Michael, if that's the right pronunciation of that. Um, yep. I, I appreciate that so much. So, and David, I see that you've posted something. So now we're gonna go back into our rooms and I wanna challenge you to something. This is why this is called the whiteboard model. How would you get to version one of your system with only a whiteboard and no computer? 
OK, so I want to jump back to our rooms and say, how would you get to version 1 with only a whiteboard? That is to say, how would you implement such a system with no computer? So what does compute power make easier, and what does it make harder? OK, so uh, this is great because Michael brought up this like great algorithm, uh, normalizing flows and VAEs. So how would you get to version 1 of this assisted prosthetics? Or in our group, we had diabetes uh, blood sugar prediction. How would we get to version one with no computer? OK, so let's jump back into our breakout rooms and continue that discussion and think about how you would get there with no computer in the loop, with no compute. All right, we are back. So we had fun in our meeting talking about the limitations of a whiteboard model. I imagine that a lot of people um, you know, feel free to dump into the Discord some of the limitations. Uh, when it's just on a whiteboard with no compute and some of the things that it makes easier. Um, but we won't dig in and share too much right now, uh, just so that we have some time to continue. But feel free to you know, dump some ideas on the limitations and the benefits of doing it on the whiteboard first. So we have a good design for what our pilot machine learning system might look like. Now we need to build, build, build. How are we going to start to develop this thing? Well, the first thing we need when we build a machine learning system is a baseline. Now, can anyone guess what the simplest baseline is that you can build? Uh, let's see if we can get some Discord going. What is the simplest? OK, I'm seeing Sahir say random, random. Iron Man says random. David Tao, random. This is great. Great. Random is definitely one. Anything, <laughs> always predict the same answer. That's great. Classify everything the same. Matt Taylor, have the human do it. OK, random is a perfectly reasonable baseline. By hand is a totally reasonable baseline. Majority class, that's always predict the same answer. Also a reasonable baseline. So now we have built our version two. We went from a whiteboard model. Now we have a version two. We're already making innovation. We're already iterating. And now we need to measure baseline performance. Um, the simplest baselines have very appealing features, too. So some things that we didn't get in the whiteboard model that now we get in our you know, super simple baseline model is super fast inference. Uh, that is to say, you just roll a die and a random answer comes up. Super fast training, AKA zero. Model size is just the size of a die. And I think it's O of one lookup on a random number at this point. Maybe someone can correct me with what the actual compute complexity of a random number generator is. So there's all these really nice benefits that we get with a good baseline. And we get one of the lines on our you know, results plot to be our baseline. So how do we evaluate it? Well, we have that data that we separated from training and validation. Like one of our examples was uh, diabetes blood sugar monitoring. Now, what is our validation data? Well, we have some held out data about what the blood sugar is based on the person's features. So we can use our baseline to predict what that blood sugar might be. Random won't perform very well. And what does well mean? Well, it's well according to the metric of interest, which is blood sugar. We might do something like mean squared error if it's a real valued number. But now we need to, even with a baseline, we need to consider bias, fairness, and equality across diverse data. So this might say something like, OK, even with a random model, we're much better at predicting one thing for this class than we are for this other class. So random might work better for one class than the other. Majority class might work better for one person over another. And this is a very interesting kind of specific minutia point, but it, it can lead to very interesting kind of issues. That is to say, like, Google image search classification was classifying certain, wasn't classifying certain people. And that's because they hadn't weighed the costs of classification versus not classification equally across different data distributions. So think about the stakeholders and how they would evaluate the model. And maybe, maybe they're satisfied with the baseline. They might even be satisfied with a majority class always predicting the same answer. So it's always good to keep your stakeholders in mind while you're evaluating these baselines. Uh, next, analyze the trade-offs. So once you have a baseline model, this means you're already making trade-offs. A baseline model was fast to get to, but low performance. There's other trade-offs that you might have. 
data limitations, the cost of building and training a model, the storage of the model or the data, learning speed, complexity, deployment, and of course, most importantly, human interpretability. So how interpretable are the results? If I just have a notification on my phone that pops up and it says something terrible, like you're gonna die in nine days, this is completely uninterpretable. I don't know what data it's acting on, and I have no idea on the causal reasoning that this predictive model has gone through to get to this prediction. Then you want to systematically remove components to determine the relative contributions of those you know, biases, issues, impacts, trade-offs. Cool. Um, and as you're doing trade-offs you know, in your baseline model, you want to be using what works, so you want to, when it's ready, when, when you can use random baselines, use them. When you can use majority class, use them. You want to be always using the best, most robust system you can. Uh, and then, you know, what is your key metric? Maybe it's the accuracy of your prediction of blood sugar monitoring for diabetes management. So the key metric is the health of the patients, the health of the people around the patients, and the knowledge and comfort that they have. This is your key metric, and the hypothesis is that you want to improve their life and well-being. And your optimization is that mean squared error. So you see that they're correlated, but not exactly connected. Then as you are building models and iterating, going from your whiteboard to your baseline to your version two, three, four, how do you log each experiment? How do you keep track of each experiment and the performance of each experiment? How do you compare one iteration to the next? And as you're going through that, once you have a safe, solid, robust storage system, you iterate, you iterate, you come up with a model. And once your validation performance converges, then finally you test your model on data. Um, Rohan says, is improve life and well-being a hypothesis? Not the way that that's stated and maybe not the way that I stated it. The hypothesis would be something like this system improves the health and well-being on these metrics for this patient class over this distribution. And then you can test it and falsify it based on evidence. Great catch. So uh, we're going to do another short exercise. Let's not do five minutes this time but rather three minutes if we can, Matt. And this is a quick one. So take the system that you've thought about. Um, it might be the diabetes management, it might be the chatbot, it might be the toxicity classification, and think about five ways that that model fails. How does it fail? What does it get wrong? And how does it get it wrong? How might that have led to different results? So this is gonna be the discussion slide. Take three minutes and come up with ways that your model might fail. And while you're doing it now in this moment in that room, uh, maybe one person in the room can type out some of the failure modes for the system. So jump into those uh, breakouts and come up with some failure modes for your models. This is great. So why do I like the pre-mortem? Well, perspective hindsight can help to identify outcomes, unpredictable outcomes. So this is like a business strategy technique called perspective hindsight that is like looking forward to looking back on the execution of a system can help to identify outcomes that you wouldn't have otherwise predicted. So imagining what goes wrong can help you to predict what might go wrong uh, just by putting yourself in that state of mind. And using insights and ideas can help you then to iterate on a new model or a new way that you might solve the problem. So I see a bunch of fantastic uh, failure modes in here, lots that are related to humans, lots that are related to the costs of false positives and false negatives. Um, we, we won't have time to dig into all of them, but we can continue the chat in Discord. So phase three, here we are on the third chapter of this fantastic lecture deployment. So we're gonna deploy our machine learning systems. We're gonna deploy our fantastic heart rate monitor for early cardiac event detection, um, who are we going to present it to, how do we present it with them, and how do we watch them use our systems for those first few moments that they use the systems. How they use those systems in those first moments, how they watch how their body is being monitored by these cardi cardiac monitoring systems is very important for you as a machine learning system developer and designer. 
see how they're interpreting the performance. What are they noticing? Are they seeing things that are more about the user experience or about the predictions that you've made? Like for them, they may not be able to see just how many parameters there are in the neural network that has led to this prediction. They might only see how slow it is. You know, um, nearest neighbors works 100 times faster than inference with GPT-3. So if I show someone the response to a chatbot uh, and it comes 100 times sooner, 100 times sooner with a nearest neighbor, they're not amazed at the linguistic quality of GPT-3 in the same way because they do this mental calculus that says, well, of course it's better, it took longer. So how else will you uh, handle adversarial inputs? So what does your system look like in terms of robustness against people who are trying to break it. One of the ideas that came up is human guided exploration for RL agents. Uh, one of the failure modes that we didn't talk about in our room is what if all the humans that you're getting to explore are adversarial? They're not helping you. They're training your system in a way that isn't helping your system learn and in fact is hurting your system performance. How do you handle that as a designer? And these are serious things that actually come up in the real world that actually happen. So what fail safes need to be in place? How do you limit your low end? And how do you communicate risks and consent to the people that you're interacting with? So finally, dissemination. You've got a wonderful research paper. You're gonna submit that to a conference. You've got a wonderful research project. Uh, you're gonna spin that off into a startup uh, and hire me as an advisor for your company. You're going to uh, make a billion dollars and sell your company to you know, GM and it's gonna be the next autonomous driving. Uh, how do you convey your key ideas is critical. So think about how you are presenting your work in a way that is compelling and empathizing with the stakeholders along the way. Go back to your key metrics and your hypothesis and show how you, the work you did supports the hypothesis. Does it support or contradict similar work? There may be people who think that they can solve these problems in ways that are different than yours or that are the same. What are the limitations? You know your system better than anybody else. So what are the limitations of your system? And be honest about them when you're publishing your work and presenting it. Um, because if you aren't honest about them, other people will exploit them in ways that you will have been expected to preempt with a pre-mortem-like exercise. How might others address limitations? So how might you recommend others start to work on this problem? And can you reproduce your results? Obviously, reproduction is critical in machine learning, and uh, there's fantastic resources available for reproduction. So um, quickly, here's a quick plug. If you are going to be a startup founder um, or you have a startup idea, there's this wonderful group called the Creative Destruction Lab. And I would recommend that everybody here uh, try their hand at being involved in some way in a startup. Uh, if you want more information, reach out, Creative Destruction Lab. Um, Here's some further reading. I'll post these slides up so you have access to these. One of the most important ones that I'll point out here is the reproducibility in machine learning. This is a Joel Pinot, and it's a fantastic update uh, to a checklist that Joel put out that kind of is best practices for developing and designing machine learning systems. And it focuses very much on the technical, but also on the human factor side. We didn't talk about the ethics of research review, but I did see some of those questions come up in the Discord, and I'm sure that Matt and company will talk about that in future lectures. Uh, but know that you know ethics review and approval is a big thing, especially for academic research and in industry research. Uh, I absolutely will be sharing these slides. I'll post them up just at the end of this talk. Um, so in summary, all machine learning is interactive machine learning. If you want to continue the discussion, feel free to, you know, uh, jump on Twitter and tell me what went well and what went not so well. Um, I'm, I'm totally happy to hear feedback, good, bad, and otherwise on, on Twitter. And know that uh, you are responsible for the systems you build and a lack of appropriate consideration for the humans involved can lead to all sorts of problematic system behavior. So I'll end there. There's about five minutes left. Um, please feel free to you know, add some comments and questions in the chat and I'll throw it back to Matt or, you know, feel free to throw Q in the Discord if you have a question. Cool, thank you, Corey. Uh, virtual yeah. clap. Um, so uh, thanks for, for putting up with me learning about breakout rooms. It turns out uh, if your browser or your Zoom client uh, dies, 
then all of a sudden you can't join a breakout room. So just yell at me and I'll put you back in. Um, I moved one person to a different breakout room by mistake. Sorry about that. Uh, there was <laughs> one person who earlier, and I believe I remember who it was, asked, oh, I'm going to skip. I, I need to miss a class for this. And I said, yeah, that's totally fine. When you need to miss a class, could you just please shoot an email to compute 656 just so we've got a record of it? That'll make my life easier. Um, I love that we that Corey talked about limitations. I see so many machine learning papers that are like, well, we invented this thing and look, it works. Well, good, but uh, way, where does it work? Why does it work? Why does it work better from this? And where will it fail? So that's something we'll be talking about in the future. We'll be talking about ethics next week. And I love that we got the, the foreshadow of explainability and how interpretability, explainability is so critical when you're working with humans. So now we've got a ton of comments. Corey, would you want to uh, pick one of these to, to reply to in the last few minutes we have? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So the slides are shared. Um, I see Graham's uh, comment here, human in the loop stuff. Um, if it's a more evident example, human providing feedback seems like an inevitable bottleneck. Are there things that help deal with the bottleneck of human delivered feedback? Well, I, you know, one of the exciting things is that you have, I think, one of the world experts on dealing with this bottleneck teaching this class named Matt Taylor. Um, there are all kinds of very interesting techniques like uh, here's some foreshadowing, Tamer or Sable or iSable or all these algorithms that help you to model a human that is provably um, you know, sufficient to model characteristics of a human di data distribution and then use that model of a human to optimize over. This can help you um, deal with the bottleneck of getting human data. There's also all kinds of methods in machine learning to handle low sample, um, low sample learning. So things like um, fine tuning a uh, large model on a smaller data set has shown you know, incredible success in the like BERT world, uh, B-E-R-T. So if you are dealing with you know, large, are dealing with language modeling problems, you might then fine tune on a data set. And that fine tuning can happen on data sets that are like 10 or 100 samples. And then you can get great generalization from that. So those sorts of methods, as they are applied to human data, I think it's gonna be a very exciting research field. And in terms of you know, interactive online learning from humans, well, I, I'm, I'm really excited to know that Matt is teaching this class and we'll definitely get into some methods and ideas on how to, how to do that as well. I, I don't mean to be pushing you, uh, <laughs> pushing you to do that, but I think so. Uh, I, I see QBs has also mentioned Snorkel. Snorkel is a great software package to help build some data, synthetic data distributions. Um, and that's another way that people do it, you know, in, in language. Then uh, Reven McQueen says, Corey, have you had experience with conflicting stakeholders? Do you have any comments on how to weigh differing stakeholder interests when designing ML systems? So this is a great question. This is a fantastic question that's, you know, quite significant because you absolutely will have conflicting stakeholders. I'm, I'm getting the sense that maybe Reven, you've dealt in a industry setting before. There are always conflicting stakeholders, people that want the cost to go down and the efficiency to go up or the number of samples to go down and the time it takes you to do it to go down, but the performance to go up. There are always conflicting stakeholders and it, it takes time and it takes energy and it takes effort to understand where their you know, needs are and when those needs conflict. And being honest and open about the stakeholders is, you know, with the stakeholders, about the conflicting stakeholder interests, that's the first thing that I like to do. So you know, I'm, just, I'm working on a toxicity classifier. I need it to be performant at a certain level, accurate at a certain level, but I also need it to run efficiently or else the cost of the system goes too high. So you know, talking about the limitations and the trade-offs, um, analyzing the trade-offs, that's critical. If there are non-starters for your stakeholders, okay, that's easy, it's a non-starter. But if they're trade-offs, can you bring them both to the table? and mediate the discussion between them. Um, happy to take that more offline because I'm noticing we are now one minute over. That's a great question. I'll throw it back to Matt. 
So I'm, I'm going to cut things off now. Um, thank you so much, Corey. This was really fun. It was great to have your insights and your uh, slightly inflammatory that all machine learning is, is human in the loop machine learning. I love it. Uh, with that, I'm going to stop the live stream and the recording. Um, and then if people have a few more minutes, we can, we can just hang out after the class.